Good afternoon. Welcome to today's webinar on the subject of RIOS 2016, where we provide an overview of the RIOS standard. My name is Austin Matthews. I'm the EHS Program Manager. Welcome. We have an agenda on this first slide, introducing some of the topics that we will discuss today. We'll go through a brief synopsis of Perry Johnson Registrars, who we are, what we do, as well as some of the benefits and drivers for certification to RIOS. We'll look at the key requirements of the standard and a general overview. And then we'll look at a more detailed clause by clause review for some of the primary requirements in the standard. I will close today's webinar with a summary of the certification process, as well as allow time for questions if there are any. Feel free to type your questions into the question field at any point throughout the presentation but I will be saving those for the end. And just to get ahead of the most common question, today's presentation is being recorded. So a copy of the slides and a recording of today's webinar will be available on PJR's website um, within the next couple of days. Perry Johnson Registrars is one of the leading registrars in the world. We have certified clients uh, around the world um, to a variety of standards. And the list of countries in which we've certified companies uh, on this slide is not necessarily an all-inclusive or complete list, but it certainly gives you an idea of our global presence as a certification body. We are accredited the grant certification for a variety of standards, including the topic of today's webinar, which is RIOS 2016. Benefits of certification vary by standard, by industry, by location, uh, there's a number of factors that could impact the benefits to certification that an organization may identify with or feel applies to them. However, some of the common themes that we see as far as benefits of certification to RIOS include improvements to the organization's quality, environmental, health, and safety performance, as well as minimization of quality, environmental health, and safety risks. Benefits associated with material sourcing and outsourcing controls. Those could uh, relate to improvements in that area or shifts to different uh, sources or outsourcing entities based on the RIOS criteria. Management commitment and employee engagement levels are another benefit of certification. Maintaining certification to a voluntary standard such as RIOS can provide a competitive advantage and or improve an organization's public image. In addition to the competitive advantage and improved public image items we just discussed, there could be other potential financial benefits uh, other than those. An example might be if the insurance carrier offers a discount for um, health and safety certifications. That's one example that I've heard of before. Certainly not all insurance carriers will do that. The standard represents a framework for meeting customer and or regulatory requirements, which would represent another benefit of certification. The standard itself represents a commitment to the responsible management of recyclables. So being able to advertise that certification, um, that value is certainly a benefit. 
goes hand in hand with the potential for improving public image. And RIOs can be integrated with other standards. For example, anyone who is familiar with the R2v3 standard, um, that is a common combination that we see. At a high level, some of the key requirements in RIOs 2016, especially when we compare RIOs 2016 to its predecessor, RIOs 2008, would be, excuse me, RIOs 2006, would be emphasis on leadership, a focus on proactivity and risk management techniques, emphasis on the outcomes of the management system as an indicator of effectiveness, communication and awareness requirements, including stakeholder and customer requirements, and the concept of change management. Some general information before we look more closely at the clauses of the standard themselves. Copies of the Rio standard can be obtained by contacting Amy Saylor. I've included her contact information there. Something unique to RIOS is a requirement that during recertification audits, all NCRs, even minors, will require evidence of effective implementation prior to acceptance and closure. What that means is that where previously for a minor NCR, you might have been able to close a finding based on a plan of actions that will be taken sometime between the issuance of the finding and the next year's audit is no longer acceptable. And now those actions actually need to be implemented with evidence presented to the auditor for verification of closure to close that year's audit, not um, to complete those activities between the audit and the following year's audit. RIOS also requires, with the publication of RIOS 2016, that every recertification audit, which is conducted every three years, uh, utilize a new auditor. So someone who has done your audits in the past will not be able to conduct your recertification audit. This requires a fresh set of eyes. Annual RIOS membership is required to be maintained by organizations who are certified to RIOS. And the standard stipulates annual sampling requirements for certain controls or processes. This might differ from other standards that you're familiar with. Some examples of annual sampling requirements found in RIOS 2016 are the competency or training requirements, communication requirements, monitoring and measurement, operational processes against which NCRs were issued during the prior two years audit. So that's again significant in the sense that RIOS is requiring something that some of our other standards to which we audit do not require. We're required to, for most audits or most standards, to audit processes that had an NCR the previous year. Again, uh, but RIOS takes that further and says that they expect the previous two years worth of NCR processes to be sampled again. And that's really to test or sample the effectiveness of those root causes, those corrective actions to close those NCRs. In some cases, we can have an issue that crops up and is closed by the client, but it's not something that happens frequently. So a year may go by, the client might have their next audit, and that same type of issue happens to have not recurred. That doesn't necessarily mean that the actions taken by the organization were effective. It just means that the issue hasn't repeated itself within that time frame. 
So extending this requirement to two years allows for a larger and potentially more thorough sampling. Looking at the standard itself, we won't go through every single subclause, but we'll go through the key standard requirements. We'll show you a number of the clauses within the standard, and it'll certainly give you an idea of the framework or the um, <clears throat> setup of the standard itself. The notes within the introduction of the standard provide guidance, but the introduction section is not auditable. So we start with clause one, which houses general requirements for Rios 2016. We have clause 1.1, which covers scope and application. And something important to remember here is that the organization is required to consider actions performed by the outside providers as well as part of the scope. That means that the footprint should include activities performed by outside providers, such as contractors, not just by the organization's employees. Within clause 1.1, we see a couple subclauses. The first focuses on Rios outcomes. This is focused on outlining implementation criteria. What are the intended outcomes? And it calls for proactivity regarding the implementation of the standard. And you'll see multiple references or indications throughout the standard that show proactivity is a priority. This was listed on one of the key requirement uh, bullets for this presentation. Uh, Rios 2016 places emphasis on the concept of proactivity, where we are looking to identify relevant risks and hazards that could be applicable to the organization, their processes, their scope, rather than reacting to incidents that have occurred and did not have adequate controls in place. So proactivity will be an important theme in Rios 2016. <clears throat> We have 1.2, which focuses on the quality, environmental health, and safety infrastructure. There are subclauses here, excuse me, that refer to requirements such as assigning responsibilities, identifying a management representative, ensuring that senior management is accountable. So senior management needs to be involved, they have to be committed, and they are expected to be held accountable for the effectiveness of the management system. This includes ensuring adequate resources are allotted so that the intended outcomes of the management system, the quality, environmental health, and safety management system, we see that acronym there, so that those intended outcomes can be met. Even if they delegate those responsibilities, not ensuring resources are adequate will prevent the intended outcomes from being met and the system will not be as effective as it could be. Document and record keeping controls are found in 1.3. For anyone who's familiar with ISO 14001-2015, the requirements here are similar. Control documents can take a number of forms and controls are expected to be in place to ensure that that process is secure and effective. Clause two 
focuses on the policy. There are requirements related to evaluating impacts and risks, reviewing on an annual basis, ensuring senior management commitment, and so on. Pretty straightforward there. Clause three gets into the concept of planning. 3.1 includes requirements to identify a Rios footprint. Again, we see expectations of a proactive nature. An assessment is required and should include purchasing, source material acquisition, transport, delivery, and so on. It's important to remember that we're not just focusing on the things that happen within the organization's four or however many walls they have. It can go beyond what's happening within those walls. Transport, delivery, source material, acquisition, purchasing, those controls are great examples. This assessment and the Rio's footprint can also include positive attributes. It's not limited to negative impacts alone. The Rios footprint is required to be kept up to date, reviewed for changes as applicable, and assessed prior to making changes that could impact the quality environmental health and safety management system. Here again, we see the echo of the proactivity expectation to review the potential impact before those changes are implemented. Subclauses here for 3.1 go through quality, environmental, health, and safety, respectively. So the first is important quality risks. The organization is required to identify and control risks that could affect product and or service quality. Risk, as a reminder, is the effect of uncertainty and can be positive or negative. I've listed some examples here to get you started. Employee theft, ineffective training, loss of a key employee, equipment breakdowns, and so on. Important environmental aspects and health and safety risks are next. There are additional criteria spelled out in each of those subsections, including the expectation that the criteria themselves be documented or controls. Legal requirements are found in subclause 3.1.4, and this goes beyond the literal legal requirement sense to also include any applicable product requirements, depending on the organization's scope of Again, controls are required to be documented. 3.1.5 looks at product, service, and customer requirements. Requirements are to be documented, as well as monitoring methodologies. Furthermore, verification and evidence as records of conformity are required for meeting those requirements. In 3.1.6, we see other stakeholder requirements. This is twofold. The organization is required to identify who their stakeholders are, as well as what those respective stakeholder requirements may be, if any. Some stakeholders may not have any requirements. But if a stakeholder does have a requirement, it becomes a requirement of the management system and controls need to be implemented accordingly. These should be reviewed annually. And if you're unfamiliar with the term stakeholder, I encourage you to review the definition to ensure that you're not missing any that could be applicable to your organization. Some examples include company owners, landlords, insurance companies, and so on. Step 
still in clause three, but moving on to 3.2, we see the concept of improvement planning. This would be goals or objectives, depending on what your organization calls them. There are a variety of inputs or items to consider when identifying what your organization's goals should be. And there are also requirements for written plans for how the organization will achieve its goals, including identifying the specific tasks that will be required to be completed, identifying any resource needs, assigning responsibilities, identifying due dates or deadlines, and identifying the method or methods to evaluate whether the goal was achieved. What were the results? Change management is found in 3.3. This requires a written plan to review the Rio's footprint for relevant changes prior to implementing a change to the QEHSMS. Again, that's the Quality Environmental Health and Safety Management System acronym. And this relates once again to the concept of proactivity, where we are looking ahead to try and anticipate any issues and needs for controls rather than reacting to an incident in which the controls were not adequate or present at all. Clause four focuses on implementation. 4.1 covers recycler knowledge, including both competence and awareness. 4.1.1 covers competency specifically, where the organization is required to identify the competency requirements for its various job tasks or some companies do that perhaps by position, job position, job title, department. Maintain records as evidence of meeting those competence requirements and verifying the effectiveness of the uh, competency or any training or activities conducted to meet those competency requirements. Training is required to consider criteria identified within 4.1.1. And the competency requirements are as relevant to a individual or personnel or position, again, depending on how the organization breaks it up, relevant to their ability to affect the intended outcomes of the management system. Some departments, some positions, some tasks may have a relatively low potential to impact, and others may have a relatively high potential to impact those intended outcomes. Awareness is addressed in 4.1.2, and this differs from the concept of competency. There are topics and or requirements in 4.1.2 for the organization to ensure their employees or other groups of people are, are aware of. Communication requirements are found in 4.2. The standard requires documented communication plans. And we see subclauses related to a variety of types of communication some of which include customer communication, supplier communication, outside supplier communication, which would be contractors, external communication, otherwise not identified above, such as stakeholders, visitors, what quality environmental health and safety information is relevant to communicate to those groups. Operational controls are found in 4.3. We see control requirements related to source materials and suppliers. We see controls similar to that of a purchasing process, 
related to outsourced providers, products, and services. And this can include things like records of evaluating those controls, specifically documenting what those controls are, given their potential to impact the quality environmental health and safety system. And that will vary by organization, by scope, and a number of other factors. It's not going to be a one size fits all approach. Quality controls are found in 4.4. And then 4.5 and 4.6 respectively also cover environmental and health and safety. The standard requires the organization document the specific controls, the criteria that they're using. An example might be work instructions for employees. You see the same for environmental impacts and health and safety hazards, as I mentioned. And this is as relevant to an organization's scope and will vary by, by organization. Emergency preparedness is introduced in 4.7. This is where we find expectations for the emergency plan and or emergency responses. And there's also reference to the requirement to communicate those plans as applicable given clause 4.2, which relates to communication. Next, we look at clause five, which relates to checking and corrective actions. We have expectations around monitoring and measurement in 5.1. These items would be required to be included in the plan as spelled out in 5.1 for the organization's consideration. And then when we go to subclause 5.1.1, we have the expectation that organizations will detail the specific items that are going to be monitored or measured. Compliance is addressed in 5.1.2. This requires annual evaluation of legal and stakeholder requirements. We did allude to that requirement earlier. This section also includes verbiage about the competency requirements for the individual evaluating compliance for the organization. What makes someone confident to do that compliance evaluation. That can be found in 5.2. Excuse me, not 5.2, 5.1.2. 5.1.3 covers maintenance and calibration for monitoring, monitoring equipment. This includes a requirement to document said calibration requirements as applicable, as well as document any actions taken to address out of tolerance monitoring devices if and when they are found. 5.1.4 covers the analysis of the monitoring and measurement re results, including the requirement to present the outputs of monitoring and measurement as inputs in the organization's management review.
5.2 focuses on nonconformance and corrective and preventive actions. Specifically, 5.2.2 covers incident investigations for environmental health and safety incidents. Specifically, this includes a requirement to investigate all EHS incidents. So it's important to take a look at the definition for incident and note that it includes near misses. So we're not only investigating incidents that led to injuries or damage. Near misses should be investigated as well to the same extent in the same manner and that uh, relates to the proactivity concept we discussed. I also mentioned earlier the concept of reviewing uh, previous NCRs from the past two cycles for effectiveness. So we did already discuss that one. 5.3 covers internal audits. They are required annually, but full system internal audits are required at least prior to certification or recertification within the audit cycle, which would be every three years. It also requires a written audit plan for those internal audits and specifies different details and requirements to be included. Clause six, the final clause, focuses on management review and it itemizes or details the required inputs and outputs for the organization's management review process. To wrap up the webinar for today, as promised, I have a summary of the certification process. First step with pursuing certification to any standard, I think, is to obtain a copy of the standard itself to understand what requirements you are expected to meet and what you'll be audited against. You'll establish quality environmental health and safety documentation to meet the standard requirements. You'll conduct any training required to meet the management system requirements. You'll implement the management system requirements, including conducting an internal audit, conduct, conducting a compliance evaluation to those legal and other requirements that the organization is subject to, and a management review after the internal audit has been conducted so that the outputs of the internal audit can be an input to the management review. You'll also need a contract with a certification body such as PJR to conduct your audits. An initial certification includes a stage one, and stage two, which I'll address on the next slide. Any resulting nonconformities do need to be addressed prior to certificate issuance. Stage one is primarily a documentation review. It evaluates the organization's readiness to proceed to stage two, which is a verification of the implementation and effectiveness of the management system to meet the standard requirements. It's a full system audit that samples all the processes, all the standard requirements. Any nonconformities identified do need to be resolved, as I said, before a certificate can be issued. Once a certificate is issued, it's good for three years. The certification cycle then moves into the surveillance phase for the next two years of the three-year certification cycle. These are scheduled either annually or semi-annually, depending on your contract. And unlike a stage two audit, these would be considered partial system audits since the entirety of the standard and all of the organization's processes aren't required to be sampled. We would cover all of the requirements between the two years worth of surveillance audits. The third year in the cycle represents the recertification audit. 
where very similar to a stage two audit, all of the processes and all of the requirements are sampled. And then the cycle starts anew with the issuance of a new certificate or reissuance, I should say. If you haven't already done so, please feel free to type in any questions that you have into the question field and I will be glad to answer them. And in the meantime, I'm going to click to the final slide that has contact information. I can be contacted by phone or email. Again, my name is Austin Matthews and I am the EHS program manager at PJR. And if you are a prospective client looking for a quote, I've also included the phone number for the sales department to get you connected with a sales rep to get you started on what that process might look like.